Right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Um, I know everybody's got things to do, and so uh, looking out there and seeing everybody makes me. Uh, I appreciate it. Appreciate you taking the time to watch. Uh, my name is Ryan Neal. I studied in Japan um, under Mr. Masahiko Kimura for six years um, as his apprentice, day in, day out, seven days a week, um, eight o'clock in the morning till eleven o'clock at night. That was the magnitude uh, and the scope of dedication that he required to be his apprentice. Um, I got back to the United States April of last year, and since then I've uh, been crisscrossing the country at a pretty chaotic pace trying to um, see what the United States has to offer and get a better idea of how I can help um, improve the level of bonsai in the United States. So, uh, my ultimate mission or goal or the things that I'm striving to achieve are to um, raise awareness about bonsai in the United States, but more importantly, provide people that are looking for a higher level of knowledge, education, technical ability, and artistic expression, um, an outlet and a resource to refer to um, for questions to, or answers to the questions that they have that they can't find in other places. Um, I was originally born in Colorado. I grew up in the Rocky Mountains. I grew up uh, around Ponderosa Pines and Rocky Mountain Junipers. Um, and I found bonsai at a young age. When I was 14, uh, I started doing bonsai. I started collecting trees out of the wild. I knew when I was 15 that I wanted to pursue bonsai professionally. And so I went to school in California uh, to study horticulture in San Luis Obispo. Um, once, uh, during my second year, I was traveling up and down the coast of California on the weekends, studying with um, different people in California that I thought had knowledge and potentially answers to the questions that I wanted to know. And uh, I never could quite get that definitive answer or find a resource for the kind of knowledge that I was seeking. And so during my second year of college, I took winter quarter off. Mr. Benoki from Los Angeles escorted me to Japan on a tour for the uh, national exhibition. And he introduced me to Mr. Kimura, who I uh, wanted to study with. And Mr. Kimura was pretty insistent that he did not want a foreign apprentice. He had, he had no desire to have a foreigner. He had had foreign apprentices prior to me. They had left a very negative impression on him. And uh, there was no way that he was going to accept anything other than a Japanese apprentice. So uh, after coming back to the United States from that trip, uh, it, it really meant very little to me that he didn't think I could be his apprentice. So I was pretty sure I could. I started writing him letters. So I wrote him a letter saying, thank you for letting me see your garden. It was truly a pleasure. I look forward to studying with you in the future. <laughs> and I didn't hear anything back from him. Imagine that, right? So I wrote him another letter a month later. I said, you know, the weather here is nice. I'm sure it's nice in Japan. And I hope you got my last letter that said I'm looking forward to studying with you. And I didn't hear back from him. So I started writing him a letter a month. And I wrote him a letter a month for two years. And uh, I finally got a letter back from him one month before I graduated college that said, uh, if you are so determined to come to Japan and study, so be it. But there is no way that you're going to succeed here. And so I thought, great, what? I'm going to Japan. Put <laughs> my plane ticket, off I went. So I went to Japan uh, with very little idea of what I had committed to or gotten myself into. I had no idea, actually. So I got there, the first thing I, he said uh, in his letter, arrive on this day. And I thought, okay, I'll be there. August 14th, that's the day. August 14th, I touched down in Japan. I had a friend who was a tutor in, in college. She had uh, serendipitously graduated at the same time I had. She had moved home. She said, come and stay with my family. We'll help you get started or get established. Um, I was supposed to stay with her for three days. I ended up staying with her family for three weeks. Mm -hmm. Because um, every time I went to Mr. Kimura and said, okay, I'm ready to go, he would say, but you need this, but you need this, but you need this. And he wouldn't help me get an apartment, get a foreign alien registration card, get a bank account, get a stamp, get all of these things that I needed. So um, she basically pulled me through all the hard times and got me started. Um, but the first day of my apprenticeship uh, will go down in history as probably the most traumatic day of my life. Uh, and uh, once I finally got established and got started and going, um, there really was no turning back, but I had no idea of the commitment that I'd made. Uh, however, I'd made enough of a commitment that there was no quitting. So um, here I am, uh, a year and a half later, and uh, being here in front of you guys is truly a pleasure for me, so thank you. Um, the tree. All right, the tree in question today, Ponderosa Pine. So like I was saying, I grew up around these trees. I grew up looking at these trees, and Ponderosa Pine just happens to be 
the species of choice for me. I love to work with these trees mainly because they left such an impression on me when I was a young kid. Uh, they were all on the way to my favorite fishing hole. My dad and I used to go visit several times a year. Um, and they are a tree that offers, I think, probably the most potential and the most possibilities of, of any native species of pine, simply because of the fact that their trunks can become so contorted and they have such a magnificent bark, fantastic character, and uh, offer a lot of potential. The problem with ponderosa pine that most people have, and I think the country is probably divided in a 50-50 split of, do I like ponderosa pine or don't I? I hate you, either hate it or you love it, right? And I think the thing that causes people uh, apprehension when they look at a ponderosa pine is they say, but doggone it, those needles are just so long, right? So long. Is there anything that we can do to fix that? Absolutely. And so I'm going to talk about that as, I, as I'm up here demonstrating. But um, is Cat in the room by chance? No? Is anybody in the room that's associated with this tree? Okay. Do you know what happens to this tree when I'm done? Yeah. What happens? Come to my house. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to be auctioned off or anything. Okay, all right. So I'm not working for you guys today. I'm working for him. Um, so generally, with a demonstration, it's all great to sit out there and shut our minds off for a while, like we're watching a movie, right? Go brain dead and watch what uh, an artist can do, and then you know, go home without having gained really anything. Um, as opposed to that approach, that kind of defeats the purpose of what I'm trying to accomplish when I travel places. Um, I would much prefer that you guys put a little bit of thought into what this tree can become prior to me styling it. Okay? If you have any ideas, I would love to hear ideas. Right? Possible fronts, potential design ideas, anything that we can do uh, that you can offer me to help me style this tree. Because I can stand up here and I can style it by myself, but I think we can achieve a much higher quality product if you guys are willing to participate a little bit. Right, so if anybody has any ideas, throw them out there. Or cascade. Cascade. Yeah? Cascade? Yeah. Could be. That's very, that would be very avant-garde. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do a cascade, right? Slant style? Where did slant style come from? All right, all right. Slant style. Do we have any potential or positive things about this tree that we want to accentuate when we design it? So, uh, <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Yes. The curves and the, the big thick trunk that are pretty much you're stuck with because it's such a thick trunk. Trying to yeah. get the best um, movement out of that. Okay. All right. So maximizing our movement, we got movement. So if any of you guys were in my critique, maybe you have a little bit of a taste of my approach to bonsai. My approach to bonsai is we pick out the best act, the best aspects of the tree first, right? So you go to places and you hear people say, oh, this sucks, that's ugly, I hate that, this tree, I just like it immensely. And then they walk on to the next one, right? Same thing over and over and over again. But we're here because we like bonsai, right? If we like bonsai, we want to maximize the potential of this tree. We're talking about what are the positive aspects? Where are the things that we don't potentially find to be attractive? How do we maximize the positive aspects and minimize the things that we don't find to be attractive? Okay? Positive aspects, good movement, right? Nice movement. It's old, good bark, yes, sir. The shari. Okay, dead wood on the trunk, right? Definitely a representation of age. Anything else? Yes, sir. I think the two negative spaces between the trunk, the first branch, and the first branch and the second top branch are very appealing. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Here and here. Yes. Okay? Yes. All right. So, as we're going to try to taper, so. Yeah. Very flat. Okay, all right. So are we talking, where is our front going to be then? We've got two options if we think that the movement in the trunk is going to be a focal point that we want to emphasize, correct? Yes. Where are those two options? Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. One in here, kind of off the corner of the pot? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. About 180 degrees in here. <laughs> and on the exact opposite side. Okay. And we find that we have a piece of deadwood on here. This is kind of a no-brainer, right? This side clearly has the best potential. Mm -hmm. How do we maximize the potential of this? Is it the way it needs to be right now? Can we further pull more out of this tree? Tip the, tip the pot up or change the planting angle. Okay, all right, so we can train, change the planting angle. So, a lot of times when we're, when we're trying to create a bonsai, we see a tree, we see something that appeals to us, and we become very focused on that. However, if we're creating normal bonsai, right, standard bonsai, bonsai that you see everywhere else, okay, that might be enough. But we're talking about maximizing, maximizing potential, pulling all of the drama out of this tree that we possibly can. I think that was really the strong suit of my master 
one of the things that he did very, very well, and uh, one of the things that I tried to, to learn and deduce from my apprenticeship with him. So, I was kind of curious, you know, if we might not add a little bit more angle and sway to this trunk. What do you guys think? Sure. Yeah. Maybe. Yes. This All right. Let's okay. uh, see what we can get here. The Navari. The Navari is present, but normally on these types of pines, right? Collected out of the wild, they grow in a crack in granite. That's what stunts their growth. So it makes them and keeps them small. And so a lot of times Navari occurs on two sides of this trunk, but is not radially radially distributed, right? So this tree potentially has that same case and that same kind of setup on within the roots, and I don't think that we're going to be able to really use, utilize Nabari as a, as a characteristic of this tree that we can accentuate. So we're going to kind of bypass that understanding that that's the nature of this tree coming from where it's originated from. Is that any better? Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Kind of? No, mm -hmm. it's better except it um, leans away from us. Leans away from us, okay, leans away from us. Is there a potential to fix that? Possibly not. Maybe. Okay, so I'm not going to lie, this is not an easy tree. It's not an easy tree for me, it's not an easy tree for you guys. Uh, that's why you guys have me up here, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Right? So naturally this tree comes out in one direction and moves back on itself. Is that the design that we want to sort of uh, chase? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you like to do it a little bit more? You want more? Yeah. More. We can do more. Let's bring it toward you guys. Let's go even farther. It's a little off the turntable at this corner. Yeah, that's intentional. You're going to lose it. Even more than that. Even more. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? A little bit less. No, 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 no. Yeah, right. uh, I can only tolerate so much. <laughs> Alright, how is that? Any better? Any worse? Ah, good pickup. Okay. So, in bonsai design, um, we always want to avoid parallel or perpendicular lines to the rim of the pot. If we assume the rim of the edge of the pot is going to be now here, we see that we've created a, a parallel line to the rim of the pot. So that's a nice observation, right? This is immediately sort of causing problems or disturbing the design of this tree. So I think probably initially our conservative angle just gives us enough of a degree to where we don't feel like we're really working in parallel with edge of the pot. So I think we're probably going to call it good here. Okay, so what do we do with this upper branch? You guys see this? It moves towards the back, it's like an odd little curve. How do we deal with something like that? Any ideas? Bring it down. Bring it down, okay. Bend it. Do something cool. Well, as flexible um, 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 as a ponderosa is, I wonder if, 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 if what is now the apex could be bent down to become a, a, um, a, a lateral branch. Um, and that be bent up to become the apex. Stay on the show, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so my immediate impression of this tree, right? We've got this slant style tree. When we're talking about bonsai design, we have a tree moving in one direction. If we counter that movement, okay, we bring the main branch back, or we bring the main branch and the apex back on itself. We've just contradicted a very strong direction in the tree, right? It's a very strong design, very masculine design for a tree that has a masculine characteristic. 
When we have a tree that's very feminine and soft and it moves in one direction, we complement that movement with the main branch and the apex. Everything's in agreement. All right, it's a very soft feminine design. It makes everybody feel you know, good and soft and nice and fluffy. This tree has some strength, okay? It has some strength, however, it's not a super masculine pine. So we got to kind of try to find a happy medium between the two, all right? Now, my, my idea for this is a, kind of a hybrid of everybody that's been throwing out ideas to this point. I would like to bring this branch down and over into this side, okay? Wow. I would like to lower this portion of the tree significantly, right? And then we're going to try to sandwich this apex, have it sitting here, have this main branch here, reduce the visual weight of this branch back here, and see if we can't pull out some more girth and character in this trunk. Sound good? Yes. Sound good? Okay, all right. So I'm going to sit up here and clean for a minute. You guys can talk amongst yourselves. I'll probably throw some <laughs> stories at you just to get an idea. Whenever I, whenever I put my hands on a tree, um, in general, I don't like to start out by doing rough work or just stripping the tree of branches. It's kind of good to get to know a tree. And some people think it's really super hokey and corny to, to talk about the fact that in, in some ways, this is more or less a method of conversing right, with, with a, a silent speaker. But um, when I was in Japan, there was a, the owner of Green King Fertilizer. We all know what Green King Fertilizer is. Everybody heard of it. The ma advertisements are in our magazines. No? Yes. yes. Owner of Green King Fertilizer. I was in my first year. I was sitting working on a tree in, in the workshop. And he came to Mr. Kimura's to uh, purchase trees and look at some of his trees that we've been restyling for him. And of course, at that time, I, I spoke very poor Japanese and uh, was doing menial labor, like unwiring and uh, wiring very simple trees or whatever Mr. Kimura was giving me to do. And I was sitting there working on this um, Guisha white pine of his. I'll never forget this. I was sitting there on my knees. We had to sit on our knees and work, sweating, because it was so you know kind of painful to sit on my knees. And, uh, he saw me working on his tree and he came into the workshop. And clients aren't allowed in the workshop. They don't cross the threshold of the workshop. That's very disrespectful. And he came walking right in and Mr. Kimura was dealing with another client. And he walked right up to me and he said, you, you, you don't get to work on my trees. You know, and I, and I didn't know any Japanese, so I just kind of smiled and said, yes. <laughs> now, you don't get to work on my trees. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, he kept getting more and more mad because he was telling me to stop. And I didn't know what the heck he was saying. And all the other apprentices were looking at me like, you gonna stop or not? You know, I was just, I was just going. You know, was working on his tree and talking with him, and I didn't know who he was. I didn't know his. It was his tree, and I didn't know he was telling me to stop. Uh, anyways, he kind of reached a breaking point, and he got right up in my face, and he said, "You'll, you'll never be able to work with my trees. You'll never understand bonsai. You'll never be good at this. You might as well go home." And he stormed out of the workshop. And I was still sitting there thinking that things were okay until he started really yelling at me. You know. <laughs> And so that was kind of shocking for me. I never forgot that. But the moral of this story, or the point of this story, rather long-winded, is every time I worked on one of his trees, whether I knew it was his tree or not, um, I, I got a very, very bad feeling. Almost like I was upset or angry or I don't know what it was. And it, like I said, it didn't matter if I knew it was his. That's, it's the way it made me feel. And that kind of left a really strong impression on me of, the character that these trees carry with them that, that we're not immediately aware of. They don't voice that opinion. Um, there's no way of knowing that. But when you put your hands on a tree, you get a, a much better understanding of what it's going to be capable of tolerating in terms of work. Maybe get some ideas in terms of how this tree wants to look and be styled and uh, develop some ideas as to how to potentially improve upon what we already have. So that's how I choose to approach my work. All right, so what kind of feeling am I getting from this tree? Well, this is a very healthy ponderosa pine. So sometimes when ponderosa pines come out of the mountains, ponderosa pines uh, tend to lack the ability to gain strength until they really get their feet underneath them again, right? Um, and in general, when we work on trees like that, typically we try not to, but sometimes we don't have a choice. We've got to proceed with a lot more caution. This tree is ready to take on some serious work. Okay, so it's very strong, very healthy, lots of back budding, and the needles are quite short for a ponderosa pine, right? Which is a sign of health because we're gaining so much foliage mass that the energy of this tree is distributed across all of these needles, right? The number one way to reduce needle, needle length, increase foliage mass, okay? So before we go about styling this tree, we've got to take care of all of the dead wood work. Dead wood, what? Dead wood. Right? We've got all of these cut off stubs. 
that once we put all the foliage around these, we're not going to be able to go back and take care of these exactly the way that they need to be taken care of. So before we do any work, this stuff has to be taken care of. And I come from a place, Mr. Kamara really likes to carve. He's got all these crazy tools and chainsaws and things that he's made that you should never put your hand close to. And uh, I was had the unique opportunity to be his cleanup carver for six years. And so for like the first couple months that I was back from Japan, anywhere I went, people said, well, do you have carving tools? Are you going to carve? Are we going to carve? Everybody would bring their big Makita die grinders mm -hmm. and, and chainsaws and everything else. And uh, the last thing I ever wanted to do was carve, actually, in Japan. <laughs> because if you carve for six years straight and you see how much carving adversely impacts a tree, the last thing you want to do is carve a tree again. However, uh, one of the things that I've started to realize was the fundamental concept behind Mr. Kimura's carving and his approach to carving. If I had my choice, I would cut and tear all deadwood, just like I'm doing with this tree, right? So that we expose natural grains, we reduce the visual weight of the deadwood so that it looks as though it's been weathered and deteriorated over time. But I started to realize Mr. Kimura isn't really carving to make something look natural. That's not his objective. He's not saying, wow, that natural gem looks like crap. I'm going to make it even better. Right? He's carving to increase visual quality, balance, reduce weight, improve the overall aesthetic of the tree. He knows he can't recreate nature. Right? If we think that we're going to make something look more natural by putting a power tool on it, we're absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely crazy. So, uh, with that concept in mind, I've started carving again and uh, rightly enjoyed it. But if I can, if at all possible, I prefer to dictate the shape of the deadwood on a tree using hand tools, cutting, splitting. It's going to give us a much more natural finish. Anybody have any questions for me while I'm just kind of... Is this a good time of year to be doing this work? Or is there a slightly better time? Or... Um, that's a really good question. Everywhere that I go, I try to heed the <laughs> advice of people in that area in terms of what I'm, how, how serious and severe I'm going to approach the work. Um, I would not hesitate to do this type of work at this time where I'm at now. But I also know the level of aftercare that I can provide the trees that I work on. So I guess I would ask you that question. This will be well cared for. It will be in the production area, most likely. Is this a good time in Chicago to do this kind of work on trees? I'm not the best person to answer that. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's right. time to heal the Okay, good. So, in general, we want to avoid the heat of the summer, but once we get past the tipping point of really intense heat, uh, doing severe work, it's a good time to do severe work because the tree is now allocating a lot of resources down to the roots as it's preparing for winter, and that massive flow of nutrition allows the tree to allocate resources toward repairing any damage that we do while we perform a styling like this. So if I had two choices, two choices, and I had to rank them in, the, in order of the best time to do this kind of work, I would say one is late winter, early spring, February-ish, right? Number two would be right now. Between now and, I'd say, mid-October are going to be your ideal time to do this type of work. What needles are you removing and why? So I'm taking off old needles that are just falling off of my hand. You can tell I'm not plucking them. Uh, if I am plucking needles, they're needles that are growing downward. So if we're talking about creating something that looks very beautiful, right? Everything that we do when we style a tree, we should always try to maximize how nice it looks when we're, when we're doing this work. So a lot of times you hear people say, ah, oh, it's just a rough styling, it doesn't matter, the wire looks like crap, that's okay. I, I firmly disagree. I think if that's the approach that you take to styling bonsai, you're always going to have trees that look like crap. Right? If every time that you touch a tree, you're trying to make it look the best it can possibly look at that time, you're investing that kind of energy and that's the kind of quality that you're going to get out of the time that you're investing. So, Right now I'm just removing the, the needles that come off naturally that are old and falling off as a result of seasonal needle drop at this time and I'm taking off needles that are growing off the underside of the buds so that when the buds are presented we don't have just a cluster of needles, we have a nice bud that's presented like this. That's beautiful pine work. Why don't you reduce the size of the gin that you made on the, on the, over there? Here or yeah. here? That one on the right. Here? Here. Yes. Why did I reduce it? Yeah. Um, because I didn't want it to look like a brand new gin that I just stripped the bark off of. I wanted it to look old and abused already. 
we're always trying to magnify the appearance of naturalness in our work, and we're also trying to magnify the appearance of age in the tree. And there's a few characteristics of pines that magnify the appearance of age, right? An old domed out crown, a rugged bark, um, weathered dead wood, and, and uh, gins that are not too long, right? Pines don't have a hard wood. Pines don't have wood that's going to stand up against uh, being sandblasted, being snowed on, being hailed on. They're going to rot quicker. They're going to rot easier. And most of the time, you're going to see pines with very short gins, uh, potentially hollow trunks, or very serrated dead wood that's close to the bark. So leaving a big, long, extravagant gin, although sometimes dramatic and sometimes called for on this tree, definitely not. How long do I leave it? Um, you could, if I cut a branch off today, I would be making a gin today, right? And if it's an older gin, it, I generally can't get the same kind of uh, exposure of the tissue because it's dry and it just breaks as opposed to tearing, right? So ideally, we want to do it right when we cut it off. But if we can, if we don't, if we don't have that choice, a lot of these are dead in the mountains before we get them, the gins, we deal with what we got. Okay, so first things first, when we address a tree like this, this is a tree that's never been touched. We need to use the appropriate type of wire to get the, the foundation, the structure of this tree set exactly how we want it, right? So this tree is, this is the softest and most pliable, most workable this tree is ever going to be right now, first time that we style it. It's time to make a commitment to getting this tree exactly where we want it to go. So I'm going to use heavy gauge wire, um, typically wire that we don't often see used in the United States. And uh, it's not because I like to use it, it's not because I want to show off, it's because that's what's going to get the job done for me with this tree, okay? So we're bringing this branch down here, is that correct? Mm -hmm. You guys are going to have to help me along. I was um, watching a TV program on time travel till about 2 in the morning last night, <laughs> because I thought it was imperative that I knew about this. And, uh, this morning at 7, Kat gave me a break and pick, picked me up at 7.30 and not 7, and uh, I was really, uh, really, really bummed that I had taken the time to do that, but, you know, never hurts to know. Um, and the program, uh, it helped? <laughs> I guess it depends on what your definition of helping is. <laughs> so did you ever become friends with Mr. Tenora? No. Um, no. I was kind of hoping for maybe something. But <laughs> you were hoping for, yes? A peace, some type of peace between the two. But no. um, you know, it's very hard in English and to Americans, and that's no knock on anybody here. It's not, it's not a representation of anything. It's hard for us to understand um, that culture, and not, not the Japanese culture. That's not what I'm saying. It's the apprentice culture, the traditional art form culture uh, in Japan, which, which basically says, um, as long as I live, and as long as he's alive, which will be forever because he's too stubborn to die. <laughs> as long as he's alive, I will always be an apprentice. Um, he will always be my master. And there is no, there is no middle ground. There is no friendship. Uh, I was back in Japan twice last year on my own dollar to help out, and I got yelled at just as much as when I was an apprentice. It was awesome. <laughs> I kept thinking, what a great idea to come back and help, <laughs> paying a thousand bucks to get yelled at, <laughs> you know. But it, it was interesting because when I first started my apprenticeship, when I first started, uh, Mr. Kimura uh, had me over to his house the day after I had, uh, my plane had arrived and touched down in Tokyo, and um, I'll never forget this. I was sitting there with my Japanese tutor, my friend, who was kind of helping me, and Mr. Kimura said, apprentices are like dogs, right? It doesn't matter where they sleep, what they eat, or how they dress, whether they shower, it only matters whether or not they're going to work. <laughs> and uh, I kept looking at her because she had this kind of shocked look on her face like, oh my gosh. 
And I was looking at her like, translate, translate, you know, because we're sitting there, the three of us in this room, and she just keeps, she just keeps saying, no, later, later. And I was like, what's he saying? I gotta be able to respond. So anyways, when we left, she told me the whole dog thing, you know, and I was like, wow. And I just remember thinking, how cool is this? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm doing it. <laughs> Ryan? Yeah. Wolf, wolf, and Japanese <laughs> street, one, one. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. We used to uh, we used to always talk about the different animal sounds and, and uh, what as Americans we consider, you know, a sheep or a dog or a cat or a, oh, yeah. uh, a frog to say and, and what they say in, in Japan. Oh yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that was it was very interesting. But uh, when I was the youngest apprentice, I was the youngest of six when I started. Uh, two years in, I was in the middle of three, two and a half years, I was the only one left. And when you go from having six people helping support the workload of that nursery, which Mr. Kimura's operation is extensive, when you go from six people to one, uh, there's a dramatic change in what happened. And, and two of the apprentices uh, finished and graduated. I saw 11 people come and go in my six years, so I saw a lot of people quit. And um, I think that time when I was by myself, nine months, I was the only apprentice at Mr. Kimura's Gardening, in, including the middle of the summer in August, uh, including one solid season of, of Kofu work, which is a national exhibition. And uh, that, was, that was really the experience that made me who I am today and probably made me capable of what I, what I feel like I'm capable of today. And so I, I value that experience a lot. But... Um, I was talking in the one fun. I was talking in the meal room just a minute ago, and somebody said, "Oh, that must have been so great that he paid attention to you so much." And I said, "No, no, that was the worst. That was the worst nine months of my apprenticeship, but but inevitably the most valuable, right?" Are they all like that, Ryan? What's that? All that matters. No, no. Everybody, every master is different, every garden is different, every professional's approach to teaching their apprentices is different. And so, uh, Mr. Kimura was widely known as the most severe and the strictest, and that was just the way it was. If you wanted to study with, them, with him, you either had to be capable of putting up with that, tolerating that, or um, you didn't get to stay long. So. Was he a good teacher, though? Fantastic. Okay. As good as they get. He's had 70-some 70, 70 apprentices, setting 73 apprentices in the, the 36 years he's had a garden. He's had 13 of them finish with his graces, and all 13 of them are now uh, very established and elite professionals. So in his garden where he came from, he was the number one apprentice of 94 apprentices. And of those 94 apprentices, four of them are professionals now. Which, which goes to tell you um, the, the, the ridiculous amount of um, endurance and ability you have to have as a Japanese professional. So I felt, uh, I felt very, very confident and comfortable in my ability when I left Japan. And uh, the nature in which you decide that you're done, or he decides that you're done, uh, is different for every apprentice. For me, I kind of lucked out uh, in two ways. The, the government official who had helped pull the strings with immigration to get me my um, visa retired from work. And uh, at that point, there were enough younger apprentices who had come along far enough that he could deal without me being there. And, and he clearly knew that it was time for me to start making a living. Because the longer I waited to come back, the harder it was going to be for me to get established. And so there came a time where we were sitting in the workshop one day, and he looked at me and he said, Okay, Ryan, I think, I think it's, it's about time that you go home. And, uh, you know, I kind of said, I don't want to go home, and I was planning on staying for longer, and he said, I know, but uh, it's time for you to go home. And that was, that was pretty much it. You know, that was, that was the conversation that we had about it. Uh, we determined a date, and I stayed through the Coke food show to help out with that, and then I went home. Um, and so, have, uh, are you considered to have graduated like those others you mentioned? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So, 
I was always kind of wondering that too, like, so am I? Uh, <laughs> are we cool here or what, you know? Are we good? Can I leave and come back? You know, but no, uh, it definitely definitely was. I gave him an extra year. I gave him what is called an ore vocal, which is a, a year to say thank you for teaching me, teaching me what you have. So he invests a lot of time and a lot of energy. I made a lot of mistakes as an apprentice, as most apprentices do, and that's how you learn, is making mistakes. That doesn't mean it's easy for Mr. Kimura. It's not like he wants his apprentices to be sitting there breaking branches off of trees and letting birds eat berries off of show trees and stuff like that, but it happens, okay? Like we're, all, we're, all, we're all human. Um, but I had made a lot of mistakes as an apprentice, and um, that sixth year uh, was the kind of the time that after, after I'd gone through all of my learning pains and whatnot, Mr. Kimura got to reap some of the benefit of the time that he had put in with me. And so I gave him a, a full year of labor, um, and he basically got mad at me anytime I wasn't in the workshop, mm -hmm. because he, he milked it for all it was worth. <laughs> I was there, I was clearly there to create trees, <laughs> generate income. But I was very, very much, very much okay with that because it was just another chance for me to, to, to refine my skills. But um, I gave him that time, and I think that from the bottom of my heart, he definitely understood that I, I had appreciated what he'd done for me, um, and that I was going to value it and respect it and utilize it and uh, carry his name well. And so um, even now, uh, I talk with him on a monthly to bi-monthly basis, and I'm, I'm headed back this winter, and I'll be headed back for the next however many years until he doesn't need my help anymore or gets tired of having, you know, some crazy foreigner around. <laughs> does he actively teach or is it just by example? <laughs> Depends on what you consider actively teaching, right? Mr. Kimura... Mr. Kimura is a um, very smart man. And one of the things that never ceased to amaze me was his ability to read people. And so he would teach us. He would give us the basics of the work that he wanted us to do um, and make sure that we were, we were going to do it. I mean, this is his client's work. These are his personal trees. These are significant, significant uh, pieces of bonsai. And uh, he would never put that tree in jeopardy for any reason other than, other than uh, if he felt like we were capable of accomplishing that kind of work. Um, is there anybody out there that wants to give me a hand with some flyers? No. Yeah? You want, give, you want next time? Can you kind of post how exactly you're doing? Okay, so. Yeah, I'll tell you in just a second. I'm going to give you some slides once you pull it. Right. What is Kimura Sensei's status in Japan? I think when he first came along, he rather upset the apple cart because he wasn't one of the old guard. Now he's the guard here. Uh, Mr. Kimura's status in Japan. <laughs> Mr. Kimura was like a he was, was hurt. he was he was uh, ahead of his time, very much so. And so when he first started and established his own garden, uh, people were very resistant to his approach and very resistant to his styling techniques and the and the sort of the modern. Um, very dramatic images that he was creating, but um, the impressive thing about Mr. Kimura to me was the fact that he could take such a, a culturally significant um, art form and something that was in a culture that was very ingrained and systematic and um, higher, hierarch, hierarchy based, hierarchical, hierarchical okay. I don't want to screw that one up. And he could do what he did, which was change change the face of modern bonsai. Absolutely. And um, 
you know, that takes a lot of guts. And in, in general, my observation of the people in Japan that have become famous or significant or developed some of the things that we find to be uh, impressive or necessary or, or things that define somewhat of modern Japanese culture were people that stepped outside of that, that sort of mold. And he was definitely one of them. But he, he suffered the repercussions of it for a while. Um, however, you can't, you can't deny the quality of his work. And I think ultimately, uh, once people kind of gave in to the fact that it, it was in fact interesting and emotional and a great representation and dictation of the art, um, he gained fame quickly. And his, his shining moment was when he entered Toriyu no Mai, which is his famous um, Shinpaku. He entered that in the Sakaku Ten, which is the creator's exhibition, the professional exhibition in Japan, and won the Prime Minister's Award his first try. Okay. So, what am I doing? Just sitting up here bending and torturing things, right? What am I doing? I'm setting the structure of this tree, right? So initially we had to get this branch down to a point where we can use it over in this area, right? And we did that. We got it there. This is a little bit unusual, a little bit unorthodox, but interesting, okay? Interesting to me. Maybe you don't like it. You can change it if it's your tree. But we will play it my way or we won't play at all. Of course you know why. This is my ball, that's why. Okay, what he said. <laughs> so, um, and now we're working on decreasing the height of this tree. Any time that we have a tree that has some significant point of interest, and we can bring the foliage, right? The foliage is the thing that attracts our eye. Everybody loves green. Any time we can take that green and, and bring it closer to the point of interest, dictate what people are looking at within the tree. Now we're utilizing our resources as bonsai artists. That's the paint on the canvas, okay? So I'm going to bring this foliage closer to this trunk. I'm going to highlight and accentuate some of the curves, some of the elements that I find to be attractive, so that you have no choice but to see them. Right? And while I'm doing that, I'm going to be hiding some of the things that I don't find to be too appealing. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll only see what I want you to see, and not be able to see what you're curious about seeing. And if that's what I accomplish, I'll win. Mm. With the black stuff you put on. The black stuff? Oh, it's rubber. It, it's um, a rubber padding. So the advantage of ponderosa pines is that they're very, very flexible. The disadvantage of ponderosa pines is that they're very, very flexible. <laughs> right? They'll bend, and they'll bend, and they'll bend, and they'll continue to bend even when they shouldn't be bending anymore. Mm. So one of the things that you've got to really realize when you're styling these kinds of trees is where, 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 when have you gone too far? Them, how do you know it except for a loud crack? <laughs> Ponderosa pines don't crack. Ponderosa pines stretch and tear. So every pine, every pine has its uh, point of sensitivity. Ponderosa pines' points of sensitivity is right in the crotch of branches, right here, right? That's where they'll just naturally separate. Inevitably, when you're wi wiring ponderosa pines, if you're going to have damage, you can plan on it occurring where two branches intersect, where an old piece of dead wood that was a branch exists. Any joint, any junction, we cross trees. Do you use raffia with uh, ponderosas ever? Typically not. Typically not because, what does raffia do? Why do we use raffia? Keep the cambium in place. It holds the cambium in place when you do a major, a major contortion. And it keeps you from shredding the bar. Okay, raffia is simply designed to apply compression. It's like an ace bandage on a pulled muscle, right? The less that muscle moves outside of its line of duty, the easier it's going to be for that muscle to recover. The less we allow this tree to move outside of the line that it has to bend in, right? The more compression we apply, the less chance we have of something snapping, right? The wood fibers separating. That's all we're trying to do with raffia. But if we know that we're talking about a tearing, okay? a tearing, a separating of the tissue, not a snapping or a violent breaking of the tissue, we realize that raffia would pretty much be pointless, right? 